gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news about the person and the work of Christ is something that not only saves us, it continually saves us and sanctifies us and it infiltrates our life. But as I was reviewing where we've been in the book of Hebrews and just looking at those big ideas week to week, Hebrews, Jesus, the first and the last word of God in chapter 1, that he is a superior and most excellent being and name, and that Jesus has recovered our royalty and that we should not neglect such a great Savior. And that Jesus alone is perfectly fitted to bring us to glory. And that Jesus is the death destroyer. And he helps us in this battle as we walk through this life, through the ongoing ministry of the Holy Spirit. He is a superior intercessor. So don't harden your hearts, chapter 3. He has achieved for us a superior rest greater than the promised land of Canaan. So question, do you believe the word of God? Because Jesus is the one who brings us near to God. He is the priest that mediates blessing to the sinner. And we are called likewise to be priests of blessing. He is our gentle high priest. He did not exalt himself. Nonetheless, he is a qualified mediator. But the question, chapter 5, are you maturing in the faith? Or are you just growing older in years? Are you maturing or are you just growing older? So go on to maturity, chapter 6, and see this God who speaks himself to bless us with his presence. Behold Jesus, the one who can bring you into God's presence. And beware sampling Jesus without bowing the knee. Is the soil of your heart ripe and ready to receive the word of God and to bring a harvest of blessing? Are you sure of your salvation? Because Hebrews 6 teaches us that we have a sure and steady anchor in Christ. He is our priest king of righteousness and peace, a Melchizedekian priest who has given offerings of obedience and thanksgiving to his father on our behalf. He is the ever-living guardian of a new covenant that will never fail. He is a high priest and sacrifice. And he is a high priest in the true tabernacle, the true temple that will never pass away. He has fulfilled an Old Testament promise. And he has given a new covenant that doesn't just simply change the outside, but regenerates the heart from within. So walk in the power of the new covenant and what he has done in your life. And don't be led astray. Do not be alarmed. And recognize that only through Christ can we approach the holiness of God. His blood sacrifice eternally secures and purifies us. And remember this, brother and sister, that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. He came into this world to do what we could never do. He is a perfect being who has, through his work, is working to perfect us. So as a church, as a people, draw near, hold fast, Stir one another up to love and good works. Chapter 10 challenges us. Make time to meet. Represent Christ through the ongoing fellowship and devotion as we live Christ together. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So walk accordingly. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And we are a people called to faith. By faith, we believe in the unseen, and we look at the example of Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob. We believe in a faith and in a God that triumphs over death. We have a faith that considers Christ as greater wealth than anything this world can offer. We have faith not only in life, but we have faith in death. So consider him, Jesus, who lived that life of faith and endure as he endured. Strive to walk in your Father's steps. Do you not know that Jesus' blood speaks a better word than the blood of Abel? So offer to God sacrifices of worship with your body and your mind and your being. Walk a life of holiness and righteousness. That's our journey through Hebrews. Hebrews. Now the question may be asked and said, okay, 
So how do I live this out? How do I walk? How do I live out the glories of Hebrews and walk in a way that is pleasing and honoring to him? That is found in verse 13, sorry, chapter 13, verse 18 to 25, as the author concludes with a prayer. Verse 18, pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience, desiring to act honorably in all things. And I urge you the more earnestly to do this in order that I may be restored to you the sooner. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Verse 22, I appeal to you, brothers, bear with my word of exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. You should know that our brother Timothy has been released with whom I shall see you if he comes soon. Greet all your leaders and all the saints. Those who come from Italy send you greetings. Grace be with you all. This grand book that we are, that today is our 64th sermon, walking through the book of Hebrews, and we've ascended the heights of Christology to see who Christ is. We've entered the holy places of doctrine to see what Christ has done for us on our behalf by shedding his blood. And we've been reminded to live in a way that honors him. But the question still asked is, how? How do we do this? How do we live out the glories of the book of Hebrews? And our writer answers that question just in the way he closes the letter by calling out to God in prayer and in reliance. He begins with a prayer request. <clears throat> Pray for us. This is a leader that is not above prayer. He says, you can be sure that we have a clear conscience. Not that he's perfect, but before the Lord, he can say, I've done this with my whole heart. I've poured out my life to God, and I've desired to act honorably in all things. Pray for me and that God might restore me to you, that we might have fellowship together. This is a very personal prayer request. And matter of fact, it's one of the only places in the entirety of the book where we see the personal plea and directive by this author. Who's the author? Maybe the Apostle Paul, maybe Apollos. We're not entirely sure. But we know it was written to Jews. We were, it's written to people who have an understanding of the Old Testament. And he was very well connected within to the church because after he gives this prayer of benediction in verse 22, he says, I appeal to you, brothers, bear with my word of exhortation. There have been times probably even in this sermon series where it's been hard to hear. Sometimes words of comfort and joy and other times it's like a sledgehammer in the face. And he says, bear with it. My word of what? Exhortation. Not a word of condemnation, but a word of exhortation to, to encourage you to move forward in the faith. Bear with it. For I have written to you briefly. I love that because that's the cry of every preacher. He's like, this is just a brief word. And you're like, will you end the brief word anytime soon? The book of Hebrews, I'm convinced, is not a letter, but actually a sermon that was given and then written down afterwards before or someone transcribed it. But it is structured, its grammar, even its closing is very sermonic. And as he closes out his sermon, I appeal to you, brothers. I've written to you briefly. You should know that our brother Timothy has been released. He knows Timothy, the one to whom 1st, 2nd Timothy is written. Timothy, that young man in the faith who bore through persecution and difficulty. And the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy talking about how we as the people of God, the church, are to practically to live out this grand Christology that has been presented to us in Hebrews or by the Apostle Paul in the book of Ephesians and Colossians. Timothy's been released. And the writer says, Now greet all your leaders and all the saints and those who come from Italy 
send the greetings to you. The church has moved across the Mediterranean basin. The church is growing. And as this preacher who wrote down his sermon or someone wrote it for him sends it on to the other churches, he concludes with a pastoral prayer to his people. Now, from this pastoral prayer, we see his heart, but we also see a great model for praying, for how we can approach God and cultivate the truths that we have learned. And so I do want to make, briefly, eight observations about this prayer. Number one is this. This is a prayer that sees God rightly. Number one, this is a prayer that sees God rightly. When we come to God, do we pray thinking that he is angry, doesn't want to be bothered? In verse 20, may the God of peace. You see, the writer sees God rightly, that our God is a God of peace. His presence is a presence of peace. He, in his very nature and mind, is a God undisturbed within himself, perfectly at peace with himself, perfectly motivated, not by war, but by peace. Now, we see in the Old Testament a God at war. We see in the book of Revelation a God at war. But he is not like Ares, the god of war in the Greek mythology, who wars for war's sake. God is warring, yes, right now, but with the goal to achieve an everlasting eternal peace through his son. He wars in order to accomplish peace. And Hebrews tells us that this peace is achieved through a Melchizedekian priest. That even in chapter 7, verse 2 the translation of Melchizedek's name means king of righteousness. He's also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. And that name and those identities are applied to Christ. That if you are in Christ, if you've trusted in Christ as your Savior, when you pray, you come into a relationship of peace with God. And when you pray, you step into a presence with the sovereign of the universe with whom you have perfect peace. Now may the God of peace keep you, persevere you, and that when we pray, do you ever pray instead of just jumping right into it, pray first thanking God for your position in relation to him? God, thank you. I have access to even come into your presence Sometimes it's preaching to our, to our own hearts the truth and the knowledge that I come into my Abba's presence, my Father's presence. Since then we have a great high priest, Hebrews 4, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. Let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace and help in time of need. Have you ever thought even before praying to write out what God has done for you? To write out your identity in Christ? Maybe you just pray through Ephesians 1 and remembering that you were restrained from God, but God, rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ because our God set out to achieve peace. If he was not a God of peace, you and I would not be standing here. If he was only a God of war, he has the power to obliterate his enemies with a thought. The only reason that you and I are here is because our God at his heart is a God of peace, making war for a time to achieve a peace that will never end. This is a prayer that sees God rightly, number one. Number two, this is a prayer that recognizes the power of God. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus. Now again, this is a prayer that you can pray as over someone else. 
It's a prayer that this week I, as the pastor, one of the pastors here, the senior pastor, to, to pray over you. May the God of peace, may you know the God of peace. And may you know his power, that same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Death is the greatest existential threat that faces humanity. It is the great equalizer, a reality that no one has ever escaped, except one person. It's interesting to note that when he says here, the, the, this God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, this is the first explicit mention of the resurrection in the book of Hebrews. But it is implied throughout. It is implied as we see that Jesus is an eternal priest who ever makes intercession. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 24. He holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. And he can only continue forever if death does not have a hold on him. This prayer recognizes God's power to undo death. And that is most clearly seen in the cross and the resurrection. Now, now think with me for just a moment. Consider with me the depth of Jesus' death. He did not die a solitary death. He did not die the death of a single person's weight of sin. The sins of one person... One of us, just one of us, our sins are enough to result in inescapable death. That's what hell is. Hell is ever dying, ever death, never fully coming to life in God as we were intended. But hell is eternal dying and death and decomposing, but never actually going out of existence. The sin of one person is enough to condemn him or her into eternal death, inescapable death. Okay, now consider that the summation of human and cosmological sin, not just one person, but the summation of it all, is placed on one person, Christ. Therefore, that person incurs the totality of the combined death and wrath that the death of Christ was so deep and so profound, he did not bear his own sin, but he bore the sin of everyone else as if he had sinned, thereby incurring the deepest death, if you will. And yet at the cross, in the space of three hours, Jesus tipped back the cup of judgment and drank it all and said, it is finished. So great a power, not just to overcome their own death, but to overcome cosmological death and the totality of the death of many. At the resurrection, not only did God roll back death for Jesus, but he rolled back the death of many. Everyone past, present, and future who would trust in Christ at the resurrection, death is rolled back. So what do we see? Death, which is the greatest existential threat that humanity faces, has been defanged because in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, he, through the suffering of death, died so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. That through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death. And here's the argument. The God of peace who raised our Lord Jesus from the dead, if God is able to roll back the tide of death, he is certainly able to help you no matter what you face. No matter how deep your hole And the anchor of our confidence, brothers and sisters, is the cross, is the empty tomb, that the anchor of our confidence in prayer is the gospel, the knowledge of our God who defied death. Number one, this prayer sees God rightly. Number two, 
It sees the power of God. And number three, this prayer trusts the leading of the great shepherd. It trusts the leading of the great shepherd. He is the great shepherd of the sheep. Now let's contrast this with good shepherd because the Bible elsewhere calls him the good shepherd, but here he's called the great shepherd. What is the difference? Well, the good shepherd is a favorite title of Christ, not only in the Bible, but also throughout church history. You can go into the catacombs of Rome, see the early Christian tombs during persecution, and see even little etchings on the wall of Jesus with a shepherd's crook. One of the earliest Christian writings, the shepherd of Hermes, was a treatise about Jesus as the good shepherd. So when we think about these things and we think about who Jesus is, Psalm 23, John 10, he is the good shepherd. But here, the language and its quotation from the Septuagint, the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, Old Testament written in Hebrew, and then uh, early Jews translated that into Greek so it could be promulgated across, propagated across uh, the, the Mediterranean basin. We call it the Septuagint. And our writer of Hebrews is quoting from that translation. And the grammar here suggests not the good shepherd of Psalm 23, but rather the shepherding role of Moses and Aaron as the priests of the nation of Israel, like in Isaiah 63, 11, or in Psalm 77, 20, where it says, you led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. And keeping in that Old Testament imagery, in our passage here, they are applied to Jesus, the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus. The great shepherd is the second Moses, the superior Moses, who brought us up not just simply from the sea, but from the realm of the dead, even as he was raised from the dead. You see, in the Exodus story, the typology there is that the Sea of Reeds, the, the Dead Sea, is death. But Israel crossed out of death, slavery of Egypt, through death, by the grace of God, into the promised land, which is life. And the Apostle Paul picked up on this imagery when he talked about the resurrection of Christ and the people of Israel being baptized through death as they crossed the Red Sea. But he's the great shepherd. He's the great shepherd as Yahweh led his people out of bondage and into life. Jesus leads us out of death and will lead us home to eternity forever with himself. Where is our security, though? He is our shepherd. Where does our security lie? Can I be lost? Can, can, I, be, can I be plucked out of the hand of God? No, and this prayer recognizes that. Number four, this is a prayer that claims the blood. This is a prayer that claims the blood. He is the great shepherd of the sheep and by the blood of the eternal covenant. If you've been with us through Hebrews, then you realize that the sacrificial terminology and the blood sacrifice and the temple and the tabernacle all figure prominently as a central theme through Hebrews. The Old Testament blood sacrifice covered sin and maintained God's covenant of peace with Israel. But it was imperfect, and this had to be repeated year after year, week after week. But you see, Jesus' blood secures. It's an eternal covering of sin and seals an eternal covenant. This is a prayer that recognizes they're standing before God. The power of God to overcome death the confidence that brings and the knowledge of the heart of our God who is leading us and guiding us and with us. And we are secured not simply because of our good works or our devotion or our successes or even our failures, but rather we are secured by one thing and one thing alone, the blood of Jesus Christ. So we can come to him in prayer. When we come to him, even in our failure and confession, oh Lord, I blew it. I sinned. I have broken your commandment. I've broken my covenant. But I come before you and I know that even though I have sinned, I am accepted in your sight because it's not about what I do. It's about what your son Jesus did on the cross for me. And I claim that blood. Amen. You see, it's an identity. It's a securing of our mind. And it's my prayer for you, brothers and sisters, 
that you would be so secured in your knowledge of the blood of Christ that it would breed a joy and confidence that can never be taken away. Thanksgiving, more than our house and the good turkey or whatever it is, or the fact that Argentina clobbered Mexico, but rather we are secure and thankful because of the blood of Christ, the blood that secures us. Number five, this is a prayer that honestly calls for help, though. Because if you notice, he doesn't come out of Hebrews and says, now go develop a list of to-dos and disciplines that has its place, and we'll come to that. But here's the first thing he does. Here's who Christ is. Here's what he has done. Here's how you should live. First step, recognize who he is and that we need his power to do any of this. The only way that we can live a holy, righteous life that honors him is by calling out to him in dependence. God does not call us to obedience and then leave us to our own devices. He calls us, informs us, equips us, and strengthens us. It is God and his work that enables us to be obedient. It's not the depth of your personal ability or talent. It is his strength alone. The writer of Hebrews says, my prayer is for you. You will run to Jesus and rest in him. Now, what does that look like? What does that mean? What is our role in that? Does that mean we do nothing? Does that mean we just sit back and just pray? We are called to yield our wills and affections to God every single day, multiple times a day. We yield ourselves to God and recognize that I can only succeed by the strength and the power of God. I can only live as I ought in the strength and the power of God. It is his work. It is his power that enables me and equips me. Jerry Bridges in his book, The Discipline of Grace, which again, I encourage you, this is a book you should be reading. It is a book that teaches us and tells us about what it looks like to yield our wills and affections And yielding our wills and affections is not a passive activity, but it begins with, Lord, I cannot do this. It is that Psalm 127, unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. He builds it, but I still labor. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand guard in vain. Some of our responses coming out of these admonitions is stop and have a prayer meeting, but never actually work at it. Or some of you would, hey, let's get out of this. We gotta get, it's too, we're too much to do, too busy to have a prayer meeting, and we're going to work at it with all of our might, and our efforts fail. The biblical model is this. We're called to holiness, righteousness, obedience. Our first stop is bow the knee and say, oh God, I can't do this without you. Equip me to do what is pleasing in your sight. Empower me And I yield my will and affections. And that yielding then looks like walking out of that prayer and in the power and the strength of God with my heart and affections aligned on him, I'm going to work at it with all my might. Holiness, pursuit, and devotion begins in yielding but works hard. Working hard without yielding and devotion only reaps the fruits of self-effort. This is a prayer that calls for help. And then number six, this is a prayer that seeks enabling for righteousness. The goal of the prayer is primarily not for personal success. Or, Lord, help me to have a good day. Lord, help us to get that house we've been saving up for. Lord, help me to A, B, and C. Now, now there's a place for that. You should bring all your prayer requests to the Lord. But let me ask you a question. When is the last time you've actually stopped and prayed for righteousness? Lord, help me to be holy in thought and deed. Help my lips and my words edify, build up, and encourage according to the power of Christ. Help me to do that which is pleasing in your sight. I'm not just praying for success. I'm praying that I would do what is pleasing. And if you have to lead me through a failure so I can please you through that failure, all God, to him be the glory. 
See how it shifts our prayer, our focus? This is a prayer that primarily seeks enabling for righteousness. And number seven, this is a prayer that rests in Jesus because pleasing him is only through Christ. You can only please God through Jesus. Only through Jesus can we bear fruit, John 15. If we abide in him, fellowship with him, understand who he is and walk with him. And then the final part of this prayer, number eight. This is a prayer that smiles at the exaltation of Jesus. This is a prayer that smiles at the exaltation of Jesus. This is through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Did you know that one of the key markers of a regenerated heart, of a Christian heart, a heart that has been transformed by the grace of God, one of the key markers is this, is that there's this inner, unexplainable desire for us to decrease and Jesus to increase. There's this affection that wasn't there before where, you know what, I still struggle with my sin and my pride and whatnot, but I want Christ to be magnified. I want him to get all the glory. And did you know that that is a God Lee, characteristic, because the father delights when his son gets all the glory. The Holy Spirit works to form Christ in us so that Jesus gets all the glory. And this is a prayer that says, not I, but Christ, may he receive the glory of my obedience. May I not just simply be obedient because it's the good right or the socially acceptable thing to do but may I pray that Christ be exalted in me and that the high priest is seen through me as a result of my obedience and living for him do you delight in bringing glory to Jesus through your living and through your dying the book of Hebrews has presented a glorious Christ he has called us to live and follow him with lives of sacrificial offerings. Now we bow our knee and say, Lord, I can't do this. I need you to equip me to live this out and then help me to work at it with all my might for your glory. And may I smile and may my heart be full of delight when the name of Jesus is known and the name of Nathan Smith fades into the background. All glory be to him. Would you pray with me as we close our time? Heavenly Father, I pray this prayer over your people today that they may know the God of peace, that they might taste and see a power in prayer and in your presence and in your being, power that defang death that allows us with confidence to follow you and to call out to you. May we never stray from our great shepherd who led us through death and will lead us home. You are with us every step of the way, Jesus. Help my brothers and sisters to see that, sense that, and feel that. I pray that they would be anchored by their identity in Christ, the blood of the covenant that will never fade, the blood that speaks a better word, where Abel's blood spoke justice, the blood of Jesus says justice done. It is finished. There's nothing else they need to do. Help them to anchor their confidence in the gospel. I pray that you would equip them not in their own faculties and abilities, but that you would pour out your spirit mightily upon this church that we might work for your will to do what is pleasing in your sight, to love righteousness, to seek it with all of our heart and our mind and our strength. But may we never stray from Jesus. And it's only through him. And may we live in such a way that should Heritage Baptist Church and our names fade into the background, may we rejoice in that obscurity so that Christ be magnified. 
I pray that our prayers would be shaped through your word, shaped in your power. And as we go forward from here and we conclude this stunningly beautiful book, lead us forward into the next study and show us more of yourself. May this conclusion not be an end, but may it be the continually wetting of an appetite that says, show me more of God. Show me more of Christ. Show me your loveliness. Show me your glory. And may we increase in fervency and desire to know you and see you in everything we say and do. We pray all these things by the power of the holy name, Jesus Christ. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.